Welcome to Rockshot Talk. Our show talks best practices, fun anecdotes, and the latest cutting edge technology in our field to kick your screen printing gears into hyperdrive. Today's episode features productive mindsets. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll be right back. I want to welcome everybody back to Rock Shop Talk, your one-stop rock shop where we talk all things screen printing. Today, we are discussing productive mindsets, and we are joined with Adam Thunderberg of Brainless Tees. I'm Rock U.S. President Ross Hunter, and alongside of us today is Mr. Merrill Caps, our creative producer. How's everyone doing? Fantastic. How are you? I am doing great. I'm here in beautiful Portugal. Um, for those of you that don't have video, I have a fake background of uh, Portugal behind me. Um, it feels good to look at. It's like a nice summer view, and I'm dreaming. It's a, it's a nice like segue of a dream uh, of it's going a, back there soon. It's important to you know put yourself in where you're dreaming. In fact, you should probably put yourself where you're where you're at right there. Let's let's see what that looks oh, like. Oh, you want to? where i was at when i was in portugal yeah like pull up myself See, in the background look at that look at that <laughs> for those listening um uh, ross has an incredible backdrop of himself with the group in portugal and he's in front of himself in his former self it's really exciting it's inception that was a good loss. time yeah I'm, I'm excited to go back out there yes me too me too well, We'll start off our, our segment here, uh, just some quick updates. We have uh, postponed our Rock US video tour um, until probably July sometime. So um, we will be doing it. Man, it seems crazy to me. It's like we kept talking about the bus and this mm -hmm. elusive bus. We're going to get this bus. The bus. Well, we is do coming. have the bus now. We have it. No, ready. I know. We're just out of abundance of caution, we're being extra safe. Talked to, about the tour uh, and we're like the tour is yeah. coming the tours and then now it's still yeah. you know yeah. eventually <laughs> eventually we'll we'll follow through on these things um but we are postponing that out to july just uh being covid conscious letting some more vaccines get out there and uh it's that actually seems to be going well uh nationally uh yeah. so it's that's good news um and what else we got going on we well we had this awesome new uh new thing to think about the whole industry with uh this automation ready score oh yeah you, you should yeah. talk about that meryl well you know it just occurred to us that there are many people in the position uh who who they want to automate but they're not sure exactly when when to Take that, take that plunge and how to do it the right way. And so we kind of created with a, several of our partners like you out there, uh, we created a series of questions and qualified, which each one of those will reveal a certain, what we're calling an automation ready score. And each, each version of that will provide a whole bunch of different resources to keep pushing you towards that ultimate goal. Make it really clear and easy for your journey. That's awesome. Yeah. We're excited Check to roll that out. When does that when does that roll out? Well, uh, actually, it uh, it did by the time this comes out. <laughs> oh, sweet! By the time this episode drops, it is live. I like yeah. when we record yeah. these ahead of ahead of the game, and I make silly comments like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a well, week, I think. Without further ado, let's get into today's episode on uh, productive mindsets. Again, uh, we're joined here uh, with Adam Funderberg of Brainless Tees, and uh, wanted to just kind of start off, Adam, um, if you wouldn't mind telling everyone who you are and a little bit about your journey um, into the industry and sort of how your company's evolved over time, and then we'll get into you know, productive mindset talk on, you know, the different things you've learned along the way and, and what's changed. Sure. sure. Um, okay. So in, you know, 2009 is when I first came across screen printing and it was just, I just bumped into a sign on the back of the old Ryanette building that said, uh, learn how to screen print. And I really didn't know what that was. So I popped in and one of the guys that, uh, that was there that day, gave me a DVD set to go watch. And I watched it, learned how to print and learned, you know, just how the, the whole process was done. 
and then went and bought a press off of Craigslist and uh, started my uh, printing and then bought a, a silver press. I still have my silver press. And then a few years later, we, or, you know, we moved out of my garage, moved into a commercial facility, uh, was there for a couple of years and then moved into our current facility. Um, right after I got moved into here, uh, I lost my job at the garbage company. So this was a sideline that I was working really hard to make a full-time gig. And, gotcha. uh, and so the business was not, um, was not big enough to sustain me full-time. Um, I, it was on its way still, you know, I just looked at it as like, uh, when a, uh, when a bird gets shoved out of its nest and you just start flapping like mad and you figure it out and, mm -hmm. And the business grew and developed. And then we added a, we bought a used auto and then we got uh, a rock uh, about a couple of years after that. And, uh, and that really changed everything. Um, the, the old auto was uh, all toggles and uh, pneumatic and had extremely limited programmability to it. And, um, mm -hmm. And then we went through a stretch where, you know, I learned the hard way that I had uh, way, way, way overextended myself. I had too many employees and um, uh, I had nine employees at one time. And then when I was oh. down at, I think I was down at seven or six employees and the day came where I had to lay a bunch of people off. I had to lay four people off and, um, one of them, I was a groomsman in his wedding. Uh, <laughs> another guy, um, another guy, him and I would pray every morning together. Uh, that was our, that was our thing. We got together and we prayed every morning, whether I was in the office or out. Uh, another, a third guy, um, uh, I've gone to, I've gone to church with his parents for almost 30 years now. And I've known him since he was like a newborn. Right. Wow. And, and I had to lay him off. And then the last guy I never liked anyway. And I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to lay him off like two weeks after he showed up. So he wasn't a challenge, but it was a, it was a super crappy day. And, um, and then we wound up going into a stretch where um, I had two accounts in one week. Uh, each one of them was easily worth 20 grand each. Um, both of them, not my fault. Both of them were, oh, we got a new, uh, we got a new purchasing agent. And he has a guy. Mm -hmm. And and so it was one of those where I'm like, crap, I've been on the other end of it where a friend of mine got a promotion and, mm -hmm. and I got a bunch of business that I didn't. You were the, you were the guy, right? Yeah, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't do anything right. I just got, you know, just in the right place at the right time. And this was the first time that I was on the wrong end of that one. Yeah. And, and so you know, then, you know, as, as things progressed, you know, the, the two people that I kept, uh, one was my uh, darkroom guy and the other one was uh, my office manager because I come from a real heavy blue collar background. And in that, I was always just the drone, right? I was the guy driving the truck or the guy, mm -hmm. you know, uh, picking the parts or the guy putting stuff on the shelf. You know, I just, I knew what I needed to do. And I was basically told what to do. And I never had to make decisions for myself. Um, and so when I had this, this office manager, my office manager, she was one of those people that, you know, you see the movie where, where somebody, where, where like somebody's doing something and they go and they drop something. And there's this weird person that just reaches their hand out and grabs it without looking. Right. And they just, <laughs> right. catch, Ninja style. Like, yeah, she was like that. And she would catch all kinds of things that I did wrong and just not tell me. Right. Mm. And it actually wasn't until after she left that I realized, holy cow, I'm not very organized at all. Like, I don't know, like we had had discussions around the shop when I had, when I had a couple of people that were extremely unorganized and, and I would tell them, I was like, you know, right now, how many people do you think that you could handle with being as disorganized as you are? 
And how many more people, how many more customers do you think you could actually handle if you had a system and you weren't playing whack-a-mole all day long and just pinging around and, and being reactive? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was, I, I saw it from the outside and then suddenly I was seeing it from the inside where I didn't, ha- I didn't realize that somebody was catching these balls that I was, you know, dropping or coming very near to dropping. And so that was, that was when I really started to develop a system because I need to be able to take care of these people and I need to be able right. to, uh, to not drop balls and make sure that, that things are, 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 it is like, um, in the, in the book, the E-Myth Revisited, uh, Michael Gerber makes a comment that, you know, it's a system. It's always been a system. You just never respected it. Right. And, Love and that I, book, by the way. Yeah. And, and I came to really respect the system. And I had to come up with my own way of being able to, to do it because an electronic system for me simply doesn't work. It, I have, I have bumped the delete button on too many things and, and like, I go, Oh my gosh, something disappeared. I don't know what that was. And it, and it freaks me out. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and people for, for hundreds of years have run perfectly legitimate businesses on paper, Mm -hmm. organize their, organize their workflow on paper without the need of electronics and, as much as, yeah, I think that if you've got uh, a, a, a system that involves several salespeople and several, you know, printing presses and several things going on, there's probably a need for that. But even then, before PCs, the cloud and all of this stuff, people were able to manage businesses just Wait, fine. you're telling me that there was a day when there weren't computers? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure that I'm sure that the art didn't uh, look nearly as nice, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There was something a little bit more um, art about that period of time, right? I mean, it it was it truly was art. I mean, it's still art. Don't get me yeah. wrong. It's just uh, it's a little bit different. So, so you kind of went through this whole evolution in your business. You were working in it. Things were gone. You had a bunch of people, you know, times got tough, had to lay some people off. And through that, I'm guessing that's, that's really when you kind of had this realization that you needed to develop, you know, a more pragmatic approach to your business and, and create a system. Yes. Um, when did you oh, yeah. start thinking about that? So was that after this, this office manager, was gone because I know exactly yes. what you're talking about. Oh right? yeah, yeah. You and I had a easy. talk like when I laid everybody off. You were like, yeah, know, kind of been and there. It, I did something like that. It's easy know? to teach too, right? Because I used to, you know, I consulted for years, so I'd go into all these companies, right? And uh, I'm like, <laughs> you got to do this and do this and do this and do this, and then I'd go back to my own business, and it's like, and not wait a minute, Ross. <laughs> you don't do any of those things. Why are yeah. you telling the, these people this stuff? Um, you know, I've learned over time that I've. If I'm going to teach something, I, I should probably be practicing what I'm teaching. But um, so what? Yeah. What moment was so that? so two things happened after the layoff. One was I started playing a different game. Right. The previous game was I want I want to double in size every year. Right. That was what we were going for. And we were actually we were making headway. We were. We were, that top number was big and fat and sexy. And, and I was just consumed by getting that number. And, and I didn't realize that the bottom line was not working out very well. And, and I was a focus on that top line revenue. It was a focus on that gross sales. And, and there was something that Mark Coudre said um, at the, uh, at a, at an event a few years back and he had he had talked about uh having different customers he he had got himself into a position where a lot of other printers allowed him to look at their books and when he was consulting 
And, and he discovered that the bottom 20% were actually a loss that, yeah. that, that you were actually paying them to work with them. And then this next 20%, you're breaking even. And then there's like another 20% where, um, where you're making a little money. And, and then it progresses up to this, this little tiny top percent that carries a whole bunch of the rest. And I decided that what I was going to do was I was going to play a completely different game. And the new game was how flexible can I be? How few people can I obligate myself to? How, how much can I make it so that I am guaranteed to win every single time, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so one of, the, one of the first things that I did after I got my feet underneath me was um, I had put a... Uh, I put an ad in, in Craigslist. So now, mind you, I had purposely not learned how to use an auto. I had purposely not learned how to use it because for me, that's just a big freaking toy. And I'm going to go out there and I'm going to screw around and I'm going to play with it. And I don't, I shouldn't be doing that. Right. I pay people to print. And so, and so all of the time that we had the, the, the first rock or the first auto. And then when we got the, the rock, I never learned how to use it. And so Josh Wells came over and walked me through it, you know, how to make the thing operate. And, and so I was able to kind of fake it. And, and then I put an ad in Craigslist where I said, hey, I'm looking for somebody with previous experience. This is the equipment that I use. I want you to just work on Saturdays and I'm willing to pay you, you know, basically 25% more than is the going rate for a printer. Right. Mm -hmm. And nobody, res nobody responded. And the, the advertisement lapsed. And I remember I was at a, um, I was at a Verizon store getting ready to like get a phone or I was getting ready to do something. And I'm sitting there in the parking lot and I'm thinking, what do I do? Do I lower my standard and, and train somebody or or do I, do I keep my standard where it is, where I just want somebody that's, that's skilled? And, and I, you know, I'm praying and, and I decided, you know what, I've got to, I've got to just hold this standard. I've got to keep this line. I don't want to cross this line. And I swear when I, when I sat there and I said that my phone buzzes and it's an email from the guy that works for me now. And he goes, he goes, dude, I was, I was on Craigslist a few weeks ago. It looks like your ad's gone. Are you still looking for somebody? And this was on a Friday. I said, dude, come by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And and he goes, I actually run a rock. I run that exact model across town. And and he came to work and he started working Saturdays. And I was actually able to tell that the guy had a work ethic, right? And that was a, mm -hmm. pre a problem previously too, was that I had hired people assuming that they had a work ethic. And it turned out that that they, they did not have as much of a work ethic as I had hoped for, right? And, and so I was, I was vetting people better. Um, I, was, I was obligated to nothing with this guy. So when he would come in on a Saturday, all of the, all of the apparel's ready to print, right? It's all stacked up, screens are burned. And I told him, I said, dude, all you're doing is printing. You're not cleaning anything, right? Like I will, my mom comes in and, and that's an, you know, like I started tapping into retired people. Right. So and wait, like, your retired mom. Yes. <laughs> Dude, you think that that's bad. Dude. Okay. I'm going to make you guys both kind of cringe and okay. <laughs> my mom and I, we've never, ever, ever worked together on anything. Right. We never picked weeds together. We never washed dishes together. Like here, I'm going to wash them and you dry them. We never did anything like work related together. Right. Mm -hmm. Her coming in a year and a half ago was the first time that we had ever worked together. And I didn't know like what her work ethic was. Right. And, and so she came in and I was walking through the shop and I saw her and she, I knew that she was like 30 seconds away from, from running out of work to do, right? And so like just out of curiosity, 
I, I turned and faced away from her and diddled around on my phone like I was doing something. I just wanted to see what she would do when she ran out of work, if she was going to screw off or if she was going to find something to do. Within 45 seconds, she comes up, she taps me on the shoulder and asks for a broom. Oh my gosh. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right. That is where I got my work ethic. That's awesome. I, and, and now, you know, anytime she, you know, anytime I have, she doesn't care what she does around here. She's happy with cleaning squeegees and wiping counters and sweeping and vacuuming and all of the crap that nobody else wants to do. She doesn't care at all. And uh, and so, yeah, I've tapped into like seniors that, you know, that they're happy with getting out of the house and getting 10 hours a week. You know, that makes them happy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and they'll show up and work. And I'm not obligated to 40 hours. I'm I I am now obligated to winning. Right. That's what I'm that's what I'm focused on is getting a good bottom line. And like I was telling Merrill yesterday, I said, now. Now my whole focus is, you know, not working with that bottom 20% at all, right? Actually right. Not, not working with the bottom 40%. They're either going to be profitable or they're gone, right? Mm -hmm. And so my focus isn't on growing and staying busy because the guy that works for me, there's been a handful of times when we weren't like super busy. And I said, dude, I tell you what, I'll just pay you for the rest of the day go on home and I'll just pay you for the rest of it because we're super profitable and, and it's distracting and bad for my head. If there's a guy and I'm, I'm giving him work so that he can pretend to work. Right, right? right. It's just bad for my head. And I would prefer being here absolutely focused on how to get the next customer, how to develop my marketing skills and and, and how to create the videos that I need and all of that sort of stuff, even if I'm paying a guy to not come in. Right, absolutely. And, and he's like, he just kind of looks at me like that's the weirdest thing he's ever heard. And then he goes <laughs> home and, and he can see that I clocked him out four hours after he left. But That's cool. So I kind of want to, I want to kind of surmise what you're saying here and um, I, it's interesting. So I think, you know, I've got a few points, but a lot of people, people get into business for a lot of different reasons, right? I mean, people lose their jobs. So I'm going to start a company. Usually it's a dream. And I mean, I'll throw this out there to anyone that's listening. You've never owned a company, maybe you own a company now and you can relate to this. Um, owning a company is hard. It is very, very, very yeah. hard. It is the hardest work. I think really anyone can do because it never turns off. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's your livelihood. It's anyone that works for you's livelihood, right? You, you, it's, it's always on the brain. And, you know, a lot of people get into business, you know, to get rich and I'm putting up quotes right here because you're in charge of your own ceiling. You can, you know, to Adam's point, when he first started, you know, you get this number in your head and you're like, I want to have a $5 million company. Well, mm -hmm. what does that really mean? And to Adam's point, it doesn't mean anything if there's no money left over at the end or if there's yes. negative money left over <laughs> at the end. You're doing a whole lot of work yeah. um, to go mm -hmm. home empty handed. And I mean, I've always kind of equated it to, I, I would rather be a cashier somewhere making 20 bucks an hour pressing buttons eight hours, you go home, you forget about it. And yeah. then you go back the next day, right? I mean, owning a business, you don't get to forget about it. Yeah. You, you sometimes don't make money. Um, and, and, you know, Mark Kudre is right. I, I, through my consulting, it was the same thing. I typically found when I went through people's books and most people were, ne I mean, negative dollars and negative major yes. dollars in this industry. Yeah. So I guess to sum up what kind of this point is or this thought, um, understand what you want before you get into business understand what that goal is what lifestyle are you trying to provide to yourself and and what you really should be asking is how much money do i want to take home at the end of the day not how much money am i putting into my company bank account and i think that that's what people you know truly lose sight of and then yeah they're not profitable because they're worried about making that $5 million. And, 
you know, in business, we have to deal with that every day. You know, I mean, even in selling equipment with us, we can discount, 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 but to a certain point, it doesn't cover the overhead anymore. And it doesn't make sense because there's no money left at the bottom. And that money at the bottom is what lets the company reinvest and hire more people and create jobs and, you know, all this other stuff. So, you know, for those of you listening, I mean, this is like, super valuable advice really reassess what you're doing open your books look at the bottom line and then ask yourselves what is it that you want and you can do a lot of creative things you know like adam's got people coming in on the weekend they don't have to even show up on the weekend if he doesn't need them because it's most likely a second job it's and it's extra money 100 you know we we you know early in my business we ran only a an evening shift so And for that same reason, it was a second job for all of them. So if we had days where there wasn't anything going on, it's like, hey, you know, you call them in the morning, don't show up today, take the day off. And then we didn't have to pay. But it also allowed us to Adam's earlier point to get all the t-shirts in because UPS shows up before five o'clock. We had all the screens burned. We had everything ready. So when these people came to print, they weren't twiddling their thumbs waiting on a UPS truck to show up or they weren't having to just sweep our floors to stay busy. You know, I mean, it was, they showed up and they worked. So it's a really just, this was a great story, Adam. I mean, (laughs) really cool advice for people. Um, Well, so, so, so now I am, I'm really more focused on um, when I was talking to Merrill yesterday, I said, you know, uh, we were we were talking on the phone and he couldn't see the way that my hands were moving around, you know, and I was like, I was like, so what I'm what I'm doing now is I've got like this bottom percent that I don't want. And then there's this next percent that I don't want. And then I've got this like this this section that I've got like broken out into highly profitable, pretty profitable. Yeah, it's profitable. And and I'm not so much focused on on growing to, you know multiple shifts, a whole crew, you know, I'm the, the game that I'm playing now is I'm, I am super curious, how much money can I make off of a single employee and an attempt, you know? And, yeah. and if my, if my press is running full time, so like, like when, like when my mom comes in now, my mom actually will reclaim screens for hours. She's in her seventies. <laughs> right. And, and she's, She's in my dark room blasting away on screens and she actually enjoys it. And, um, uh, and, the, and my, my press operator thinks it's super cool that she's reclaiming screens too and not him. And, and <laughs> so, bet. and so, you know, it's one of these things where I'm like, you know, if I can continue trading and, and I go, okay, so what my focus is, is this top, 60% where I'm actually profitable. I don't take anybody that's unprofitable. And then I keep reaching for adding new hyper profitable customers. And then I add them and then I push somebody out. I don't try to add shifts. I'm not trying to add to my total volume. I'm trying to keep my capacity the same, but make it so that all of my, my company is just more profitable. And, and we, you know how you've got kids, right, Ross? Mm-hmm. Okay. How old are they? Five, uh, six as of- uh, Oh, they're little. The 20, six, and I've got a bun in the oven. Oh, well, congratulations. All right. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So my kids are married and moved out, and uh, my wife and I started super early, right? <laughs> And, uh, we did the opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my my wife my wife turned twenty six days after giving birth to our first. Oh my! Wow. And and so uh, so anyway, you know when uh, I did I did a couple of things right, and one of the things that I really did right was with my kids uh, when they became a uh, dating age. I told them that you know I have two rules. One is that they have to go to church. And the second is that they have to come to the house once a month and play uh, a board game with me. They have to play uh, cash flow with me. Uh, um, it's a Robert Kiyosaki, rich dad, poor dad game, right? It's all about how to handle money. And the whole target of the game is how to, how to get yourself to a point where you're able to make money passively, 
right? Whether you mm-hmm. own businesses, investments, real estate, you know, whatever, right? And and even though I had taught my my sons in law, they both married my daughters, right? They they these two guys they came, they played, they actually badger me still because I'm like, you're married, we don't need to play. Like it was a rule, like while you're dating, we have to play once a month. And after they married my daughters, they're like, yeah, I really liked playing. And so anyway, um, but what I had learned was that, that if you can figure out how to make good money, you can make investments and, and get your passive income through other vehicles. You don't need to build a business that, it, that you're going to have a liquidation event and you're going to make your pile of cash at, at your exit. And that was where my head was the whole time. I'm going to make this freaking thing huge and then I'm going to cash out and then I'm going to go make investments. And, and part of it came because I had an encounter with the IRS where my IRS read, he, he, uh, he's got this really monotone way of talking. And he was all, Mr. Funderburg, we're not really happy with you. And we're so unhappy with you that we're going to give you three weeks to come up with $17,000. And if you can't come up with $17,000, we're just going to shut you down. And I'm like, three weeks, huh? Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, and so, like, I'm like, holy cow. I went away and I sold like mad, right? I sold like mad. And... And I got the money to him on time, right? And as I was driving home that day, I was like, dude, an employee couldn't have pulled that one off. There's no way. As an employee, you can't do that. But as a business owner or a self-employed guy, you can, you have that kind of capacity, right? And, and, and it actually got me to thinking, holy cow, I misunderstood the, the cash flow game the whole time. I don't need to build this business to have some kind of massive liquidation event, I can build this business so that it generates so much revenue that I can, you know, like when, if you guys say, Hey, Adam, how will you know that you arrived? I'll go. Cause I own every house on that block. Right. That's how I'll, I'll be able to say, yeah, I arrived. I actually hit my target because I own those 25 houses over there and I actually don't need to work. I just work because I like to work and I need to be productive. And I like the caliber of people that, uh, that I meet. That's awesome. It's excellent. Awesome. Awesome. We're going to take a quick commercial break. Uh, when we come back, we will talk more productive mindsets. We'll be right back. Leadership legend Dale Carnegie once claimed, an action breeds doubt and fear. Action breeds confidence and courage. If you want to conquer fear, do not sit at home and think about it. Go out and get busy. In that light, we've created our first ever ebook outlining the seven worst fears that prevent most screen printers from going auto and the simple solutions to remedy each one. To download your free copy today, please visit rock.us or call 187-ROCKET-NOW. That's 877-674-8669. I want to welcome everybody back to Rock Shop Talk, your one-stop rock shop where we talk all things screen printing. Today, we are talking productive mindsets, and we are joined with Adam Funderburg of Brainless Tees. I'm Rock US President Ross Hunter. Alongside of us as well is Mr. Merrill Caps, our creative producer. Welcome back, everyone. Hello. I changed my background, too, to have my big face. Oh, look at you. And when I say big face, I mean literally, (laughs) look at how much it's shrunk. (laughs) 40 pounds in a year. That's awesome. Nice. It's actually kind of fun to look at. It makes me feel good. I was just so a tough just, journey. So you don't have a big head is what you're saying. Oh, well. It it's not shaped like you're... that. It's still big, but it's not <laughs> right? shaped right? like It depends that on how you're <laughs> describing it. <Meryl. laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> you know my video entirely. There you are. All right, cool. Well, um, what did I kind of kick uh, back off? Uh, this segment um, talk a little bit about the investment in your rock you and what that meant for you and how it affected your business during all this transition. I know you've had some kind of statistics even behind what the press has done for your company. So we'd love to kind of hear that story. Yeah, sure. Um, So like I had mentioned, we, we actually, 
the way that we have done stuff in the past is we bought used equipment and kind of got a feel for how it was going to affect the business. And then we would make an investment into something new. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just been the way that we've cycled through things. Now with an auto, I would say this is probably one of those pieces of equipment where I would say, I would say that if I was to do it over again, I would go straight and buy something new. Uh, I wouldn't go and, and look at a used piece of equipment because the thing is, is that if you've never run an auto and that sort of thing, it's, there's, there's a fair amount of training set up. There's, there's quirks that happen with old machines, like the, the machine that we bought, you know, it's, it's one of those things where if you've owned it and you've, you've used a, a piece of equipment, especially the old pneumatics, right? Where, where the, the carousel is slamming up into the press and, and things wear out fast, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so you wind up with one head that prints kind of funny and you wind up with, with the, you know, you wind up with your favorite heads and you wind up with the ones that like, if I have to, I'll use that one. And, and as the press operator and you you're used to the, the aging of the equipment, you, you know, walk with a limp, right. But mm -hmm. to hand that to somebody and then all of a sudden they're like, the heck's wrong with head five. Right. And, and there's just massive amounts of frustration with all of the quirks. You just handed somebody's old, piece of equipment with all of these quirks with a rock you know getting getting this rock when we got it as much as it was used it was so lightly used that it was practically brand new it was it hadn't even hit the break-in periods for its first like service right maintenance right and, yeah. yeah so i mean technically it was used but it wasn't really used and and so like i was telling merrill yesterday if, if you look at the price tag on a part-time employee or on a, uh, on, a, on a minimum wage employee, it's almost the same price as the monthly payment on a rock, right? Right. And, and the, the, the rock, I've had it for uh, two and a half years. It's never come in hungover. It's never, it's not right-hand dominant. It doesn't do any quirky weird. It doesn't talk back. You know, has it had they, any HR issues? No, no, it hasn't. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, good. <laughs> like when I have when I have been frustrated at it, you know, it hasn't cared at all, right? And 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 honestly, I was actually telling Marilyn about that. I've had two issues with it where it did something weird. And I got a hold of Bucky, and Bucky walked me through like how what was wrong with it. And I was back up and running in like 30 minutes. And, so, and one of them that I was telling Merrill about, I'm like, dude, there was, a, there was a nut that backed off of a bolt in the foot pedal. And so the inner mechanism in the foot pedal thought that was telling the machine that the pedal was pressed while the outside housing, the pedal was up, right? And so we're just like, what's going on around here? I call Bucky and he has me pull up some menu and he's like, is any of those things red? And I said, yeah. And he goes, okay, now you're going to, and he walks me through all of this and, and he goes, does anything look out of place? I said, well, there's a bolt that's backed out. And I put it back in, I screwed it back together and we were back up and running. And, yes. and yeah, Bucky's freaking awesome. I've only had to, I've only had to talk to him once or twice, but what he, the, the way that he, attacked and approached the situation um and the fact that that he got he got back to me within 20 minutes of the service being like sent like him getting the, the message. fir like he the was, form fell excellent. yeah he was he was That's on awesome. it well see i i called somebody over there gotcha at, gotcha. Uh, at rock um uh, i called somebody at rock usa and said you know, rock us right it's not usa it's us yeah. Um, and, and I talked to somebody over there and they said, oh, let me, let me get a hold of Bucky. And they, they, they filled out the form and then Bucky called me. Oh, even uh, but, but like I was, um, uh, like I, but like I was telling Merrill, you know, like the, the difference in speed between having a, a manual press where you can only push one squeegee at a time and, 
and having an auto where you can have six squeegees going, it's the, the, the speed difference is ridiculous. And even if you're doing a print flash print with, with two passes of white ink, if you have, you know, a, if you have a flash, even if you're doing like, say a, like hoodies, we'll put it on the flash to shrink the thing. Mm -hmm. And then we'll squeegee the white and then we'll flash it and then let it cool and hit the, the second white, right? And, and so our speed, even on something as simple as that, is massively better than, uh, than, than doing it manually, right? Once you start adding in multiple colors, like we're getting ready to do a six color job and there will be several squeegees that are moving all at the same time throughout the entire process. I, I had a job come through one time where we had 200 shirts that were a six color print on a manual press. <laughs> and that hog, that killed- That's a day. That <laughs> killed production, right? Yeah, yeah, that took a whole day. And, and in my case, that was when I had like six or seven employees. And, wow. And so, so you're making, so, dude, you're maybe making a thousand dollars, but you're paying six people. Dude, everybody just mean? stood around watching this guy work because there wasn't mm. enough for them to right. do. And that's, that's part of what, you know, that's why I'm playing this completely different game. Right. When like, even in those cases, right. Where, where it's got to go around two, three times. Right. Even now with the rock, like it goes around two or three times my guy will throw it on the conveyor and then he'll, he'll load the thing and then he'll go to the other end and he's able to catch his own catch and stack his own shirts. So he's kept busy the whole time. And it's not like I need somebody down there catching, you know? Right. Nice. So, so yeah, with, with, I had actually gone out of my way to not know how to run the auto because I wanted to be absolutely focused on sales and on running the company. And that was what I was focused on. And if I knew how to make the thing move a squeegee, I would go out there and screw off and play around with that thing after hours. And, and so That's interesting because I knew that I would look at it like a big giant toy, mm -hmm. I decided to actually not learn how to use it. And I know that on the, uh, on the older auto that we had, where it was all just straight toggles, I would have freaked out and set that thing on fire after a little while. Because even after those guys knew how to operate it, it still did weird crap. It still did, you know, it still did irregular things. And the rock simply doesn't do that. You know, like it's all touch screen. It's all, you know, when when it does do something unexpected, the question is, what am I doing wrong? Now, right. Generally, I ask that question after I've yelled at it a couple of times. But then, I, <laughs> but then I realize, okay, this is stupid. It's obviously me. Take a breath and like, oh crap, I didn't like I, I programmed it wrong or whatever, right? Right. But but now, you know, now if I need to, I can go out there and fake it. I can because the 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 touch screen and everything's super intuitive. And yeah, it's lovely. That's awesome. I was going to tell our yeah. listeners too, because we've just done this on quite a few of our products, but um, Adam was making the point of, you know, the difference in manual versus auto and kind of the dollar savings that come with that, even though you, you've got a, a payment, um, we've added uh, that exact ROI calculator onto our website. Um, and it is on the, the Rock U and the Rock Fit pages. So mm -hmm. any of you listening that want to go kind of see what those numbers would look like for yourself now, you can go play around with the, the toggle. It'll ask you a few questions. You toggle some things in. It'll actually show you, based on your current production, what would your savings be monetarily if you were to automate? Um, and I was resistant to automating when I was manual, too, for the expense reason. And Dude, I'll tell you, the, yes. it's scary. But <laughs> the second I did it, my business took off. And I started making Dude. more money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that all of a sudden you have more time to call people. You yeah. have more time to, to sell and to learn how to market. You've got, you know, so, so if I go out there and, and my time goes from, 
some of it comes from the mindset of being an employee to being an employer. The mindset of an employee is to be busy, right? And there's mm-hmm. the there's the assumption that if I'm busy, I must be productive, I must be making the company money, right? And and if you take that into the mindset of an employer, you're like, okay, the busier we get, the more money we make. And that's complete crap. It's not true at all. You can be super busy not making money. And it's very, very frustrating. Mm-hmm. If you can automate and get yourself to a place where, okay, so I wound up instead of making 60 bucks an hour, now I'm making 800 bucks an hour. How many hours do I need to work at the 800 bucks an hour to, to make the same amount, right? Or to compensate to cover right. for the auto, right? And, and so even if now all of a sudden you, like say you, you're working with a manual press, like we were talking about with the six color print, right? Mm-hmm. I've got a manual press and I, and right now I'm out there printing eight hours a day. And then I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get sales and I'm doing all of this stuff with the, the other two hours or whatever, right? I'm putting in 10 hours, 12 hours a day. Now I go get an auto. All of a sudden I'm getting everything done in three hours. Now yeah. I've got time to figure out the marketing. Like I get, I get all of that money made faster, higher quality prints, everything's better. And you have more capacity to grow a company. And, and after you take the leap, you're like, dude, that was, it makes sense now. That, it's a lot that, more fun to do that math too, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I remember, oh, this is years and years ago, but we did, I think it was about a 600 piece hoodie run and it was a two color front print. And our press was running about uh, with hoodies, you know, 450, maybe 500 an hour, give or take. And we charged 40 bucks a hoodie for this, right? Oh. So mind you, the $24,000 order, the hoodies at the time, I think I was paying like 16, somewhere in there, or not 16, that was less than that, seven, eight, nine bucks. I mean, this was like, I don't know, 13 years ago. And I calculated it out. We made $20,000 an hour or something. I mean, it was, it was, it was insane. And it was like this. And I remember after that day, I'm like, I need to sell that exact chunk <laughs> over, over and get over and over that again. little teeny sliver at the top and then push yeah. everybody. Like, like if you treat it like, like it's a, like it's a, this is my capacity and I don't want my capacity to change. And then you get a big job that drops in and it just shoves some punk off the bottom. And, and my fantasy is that, that if, if I looked out at three zip codes, because my whole target is I just want the top customers in three zip codes, right? If I looked out at three zip codes and say, just for discussion sake, that there is a thousand customers that are in that, that those three zip codes. And my whole focus is I just want that top 100. I can make a lot of money off that top 100. But mm-hmm. if I am resistant to like, I'm gonna serve everybody, it's just gonna be a mess. So- Absolutely. Yeah, that's something I would love to talk more about. Uh, from our discussion yesterday, Adam, you were just talking about some really cool things about how to really carve out your niche, your audience with, with these mentalities. And you said sure. some things that were interesting to me, like, um, the metaphor of farming and sure. uh, that kind of thing. And also what I'd love to mention as well as the, what we talked about kind of the esoteric um, dog whistles in, in language sure. and the yeah, secret sure. handshakes. So secret. talk more about that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, there were two things that I did to help ferret things out. One was um, I started thinking about farming, like, okay, so, I've got a I've got a bunch of different forms, and uh, the forms all have different kinds of purposes to help me figure out great markets, to figure out my marketing, to figure out how to organize my day. Um, I just have I I started creating a lot of forms to make it so that um, so because because I've had this happen too many times where crap here comes May I know who's buying but I still didn't prepare my marketing for that 
market, right? And so now I have a system where in April, I'm preparing the marketing so that May 1, I can launch a full campaign while all of my competitors aren't doing that, right? And so part of that, you need to know your market, right? You need to actually know who you're targeting. And, and so one of the things that I did was I got to thinking about, um, you know, farming, like in the, in the Pacific Northwest here in, in sunny Vancouver, Washington, you cannot, um, you cannot put up a, an orange grove, right? You couldn't grow pineapple around here. And, and there's, but you can grow apples. There's a lot of, of apples and grapevines, and there's a lot of things that are native to this area. And, and so if I look around this county, what is the, what is the most native thing? And the most native thing for me is uh, going to be the blue collar industrial types, right? The people that are working construction and all of that sort of thing. And then we were talking about, um, you know, how to find your, uh, your niche. And the, the tool that I used there was, you know, for me, I can, because I come from a heavy blue collar background, I could, even though I've never been a plumber, I could dress up as a plumber, go hang out with the plumbers, and I would fit right in because I understand the language. I understand like getting dirt all over you. And I, I understand how all of these different things work. And if I went to go try to sell band merch and I started tried to talk to musicians and that sort of stuff, I would I would struggle to fit in. It wouldn't be nearly as natural. I would have to work myself into my enthusiasm. And when we were talking about um, you know secret handshakes and and using words that are native to that market, I had said you know that that when you're talking to people that are like a volleyball coach, sneak in the word libero, and they'll be like, "Holy cow, this is my tribe! Oh my gosh, this guy understands my market, right?" And and so with a couple of those things, you know, I had I had niched down. And, and the, one of the things that I was telling you about was that about 13 months ago, I hired my first business coach. I actually don't think I told you it this way. And, and COVID had just settled in and I was sitting there mulling over, like I had wanted to niche down. And when you looked at my website, my website was really weird looking. One side of the screen had a construction worker with a hard hat and a safety vest, like staring off like a model. And the other side had had three girls in softball hoodies and braces smiling and giggling, right? And it was so conflicting and it just aggravated me every time I looked at it. And I niched down and I got rid of everything off my website that refers to sports, that refers to school spirit wear. I, I got, and then I went through my showroom. My showroom is now like a shrine to... Uh, blue collar industrial people. And <clears throat> the thing is, is that even though it was in, in my situation, because the schools were shut down, the sports were shut down, it wasn't nearly as risky. People, when they go looking for a, uh, a printer, will just type into Google screen printing. They don't even look at your website sometimes, right? Right. But, but, now I, I still get these calls from schools. I still get these calls, but my tribe, my blue collar industrial guys, when they go to my website, they're like, holy cow, this is my guy, right? Mm -hmm. I, I had a sale in December that was, I think I did close to 20,000 in two transactions uh, for a volleyball club, but you won't find a single picture of it on my Instagram because I don't want more of that customer. I mm. only put stuff on my Instagram that I want more of. So I will, pr I will put a picture of a construction job that I did four years ago mm -hmm. before I'll put the $20,000 picture uh, because that's I don't want more of that. I want right. more of the other. That's really, really uh, tactful. It's brilliant. That's awesome. Um, well, cool. Uh, quick commercial break and we'll come right back after that. Sounds good. We'll be right, right. back.
We know you want to continue to stay in the forefront of the industry, but there are several variables to consider when determining the best time for your business to automate. We believe your attention is too valuable to be lost to this concern, which is why we worked with our incredible partners like you to develop the first ever Automation Ready Score. Visit rock.us to receive your free Automation Ready Score today and press onward. All right, I want to welcome everybody back to Rock Shop Talk, your one-stop rock shop where we talk all things screen printing. Today, we are talking productive mindsets, and we are joined with Adam Funderburg of Brainless Tees. I'm Rock US President Ross Hunter. Alongside of us, our creative producer, Mr. Merrill Caps. Welcome back, everyone. Hey, hey. Thanks for joining us. So we were having a great conversation in the break. I'm going to let Merrill kind of kind of kick off the, the topic yeah. and the question here. Yeah, for sure. We had uh, just a quick little anecdote uh, of Adam talking about how you presented the problem, just instantly created solutions for yourself. Sure. So this how, is with the well, press, right? When, when you purchase the, the rock. No, no, no. That was when I printed, when I got my first auto. First uh, auto. Oh, my, okay. First my, auto. Uh, my arrangement with the, uh, with the, with the rock was equally um, was actually like uh, very similar. When I was looking at getting my first auto, it was, um, I was offered uh, a smoking deal. Now, when I said that that was 7,000 bucks, that was 7,000 bucks for the auto and a 48 inch conveyor. This guy just wanted it gone. And he was absolutely convinced that the equipment was cursed, right? Mm -hmm. His employees were, were, everybody was convinced. They tried to warn me off of it, but we were pretty sure that we could actually like adjust it and that they were, they were the problem. And and so anyway, we, um, uh, they gave me a price. It was like 7,000 bucks. And I had two customers that I did a ton of work for. And one, I, I said, Hey, you know what? If you spot me 3,500 bucks, I'll give you $5,000 worth of service. And I'll just mark it off as you place orders. I gave both of them that same offer. And one of them took me up on it. And they got fifteen hundred dollars worth of free service. The other one was just super happy for me, and and loved to see people win, right? Mm -hmm. And so he said, "Here, wrote me the check for thirty five hundred bucks while I was standing there, right? I made the That's proposition, cool. and he goes, yeah, sure.' <laughs> and he like just wrote me a check, right? And wow. And when we oh, and I wound up selling the machine, and I made a thousand bucks. Right. Nice. And when we sold the machine, like after we used it for a couple of years, we made a thousand bucks. And, and when we got into the rock, it was one of these deals where Ryan had come by, we were talking and he, he had presented me with the idea of, of the numbers of, of what we could do per hour with his equipment versus our equipment and our equipment, it was, it was older and it had a limp and it just, you know, it wasn't, uh, it was better than a manual, but I would have, I really wanted an auto or a rock. Right. And, and so we wound up in this circumstance where I had, I had pretty much no money on me and, um, I wound up getting the machine. I know that I, I don't think that you guys even offer a rental program anymore. No, but this was on a rental in Southern California. And Ryan basically said, Hey man, if you cover the cost of shipping it up because it was actually being stored at somebody's facility, if you pay for, for it to be shipped up here, we'll install it. We won't do the whole 5,000 down. You know, there were, there were a couple of things that he did where it was really just like, because we're friends and because what I think, uh, you know, I've known you guys for a long time at this point. Right. And, and, <clears throat> And so I, I, I was able to come up with that money. And then to get the thing wired in, um, I didn't have the money to get the thing wired in. And one of my customers um, runs a uh, commercial electrical company. Nice. And, and they were getting ready to place a big, like six, seven, eight thousand dollar $8,000 order. And so they, they said, hey, you know what? Uh, we'd be happy to install that thing for you, wire it up for you. And so I got, so everything coordinated where, okay, this is where the machine's going to be. I showed them, I showed the electrician, the schematic. They said, they brought in the wire. They brought in the wires, the breakers. They, they bought everything. So I was out so of cool. pocket, nothing. And I just nice. credited against their next order. I still made money on their order. Right. So amazing. 
<laughs> Amazing. So yeah, it was pretty awesome. awesome. Adam, I would, I would love for you to share your story about this kind of uh, pragmatic approach that you, you learned with uh, that your, your wife experienced that you shared with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chart. So my wife actually inspired uh, some of the organization that we, that we do, that I, that I have at the shop. So like I said, I'm, I'm really an analog guy. I, I'm not really hyper about um, digital planners. And I think it was before we started where I had made a comment that perfectly legitimate businesses have been run off of paper forms. Mm -hmm. And, and for me, every, I've, I had it happen just a couple too many times where I bumped something, something disappeared off my screen and I didn't know what it was. And I knew that I had dropped a ball and that, that unless I remembered what it was, something was hitting the floor. Right. And so what my wife did um, was she has this list where she writes down just stuff that needs to, the for the shopping list, right? So she'll put on there, you know, apples and yogurt and granola and, you know, milk and whatever, right? And she'll put all that on there. And then when it's time to go shopping, she will pull out a, another sheet of paper and she'll fold it in half so that it's, it's like an eight and a half by 11, uh, you know, shape it's it's short and wide and then she will take everything that's on her list and start transcribing it right and so she'll go milk and she'll put it up at the top and then she'll go uh lemons and she'll put it over here and then she'll go meat and she'll put it up here and and when we go shopping it becomes a topographical map of the grocery store right so as we start walking through the store we're walking through her list right Mm -hmm. And, and it makes it just super efficient, right? So we never wind up doubling back. Mm -hmm. And when I go by myself, sometimes I don't use the list. I am all over that place. <laughs> and, and sometimes I'll be like, that granola is all the way across the store. I guess I'm going without granola this time. And, and, <laughs> and so, so what I've done, what I've done is I, I started putting together a, uh, a sheet. And what I have is I've got a dash line here. It's an eight and a half by 14 sheet. I've got a dash line here. So over here, I have all of the shop agenda. And then over here, I have all of the office stuff. And so I get here a couple hours before my press operator does. And I'll take the sheet from the previous day. And I will set it above this on the table. And I'll take his sheet because after I've set his agenda, I cut it here and I, I will go hang it out in the shop and it's all mm -hmm. in numerical order. And, and he just starts going down his list, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, and he starts working through his list. And, and so what I do is I, I'll take his previous list. I'll set it here. I'll put these things back together and I'll transcribe anything that didn't get done. And as I'm transcribing things like screens and printing and tasks, and, and I'm adding on the, the new stuff for today, or I take the, you know, and, and as I'm working through this, I'll do stuff like discovering, shoot, I forgot to make the transparencies for him to burn, or I forgot to do. And so my list, I start numbering all of my stuff. And this thing has made it so that when I'm in the office, and he comes in and goes, I'm out of emulsion. I go over here to the section labeled order. I write emulsion. I give him a thumbs up. He goes back to what he's doing because he knows it's going to get done. Mm -hmm. And I go back to what I was doing. And an interruption that actually could have taken and, and derailed me for 10 minutes derails me for just a few seconds. I'm right back to where I was. Oh, and, right. and through this, I'm able to keep track of all of my quotes, my leads, the jobs that are currently going on, my financial stuff, all of my current stores that are open, the screens that need to get made, the stuff that needs to get ordered, the tasks. Over here, I have all of the stuff that is like at seven o'clock, I work on my marketing. Eight o'clock, I'm returning phone calls and working on art. And like, and it it helped lay my day out. And, and I actually had this available at adamfunderberg.com where you don't have to like sign up to get on the email list or anything like that. It's just there where you click on it and you can download it. Mm -hmm. 
That's excellent. So you're pragmatically systemizing intention. I am, I'm making it so that I can, at the start of my day, I can prioritize my day. Mm -hmm. I can look at everything. I can lay out my priorities and I can start attacking the day and have my conscience be, you know, my mind super clear, like where I'm at is where I should be at any given moment. Nice. And when I go home, I'm never thinking that I forgot something. Like mm -hmm. since I implemented this, I sleep straight through the night. I don't wake up like worried and doing an, oh crap, I forgot. You know, that yeah. just yeah, I forgot happen. to order that emulsion and we're not Dude, gonna be able to print tomorrow. It just yeah. doesn't, yeah. it just doesn't happen. And then um, like I was like I was showing Merrill, you know, I, I came up with this, this what I call my Yahtzee marketing system. Right. Where I use a, a basically a Yahtzee card that I put together that makes it so that I know the kind of marketing that I need to put out on Instagram every Monday, every Tuesday, every Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So it's not a random like mm -hmm. it's not just this random dish where I'm just shoving stuff out. And it's not like a whole bunch of the same thing. Right. One after another. It's it's actually a formula mm -hmm. and it's a. It's, it's a list of ingredients that I have that are super intentional. Like I have a certain number of offers. I have a certain number of things that I want to promote. And so I actually have another sheet that I came up with. This is what it looks like when you tear the sheet off because um, they're stacked up. So this is my Wednesday sheet and this is my Thursday sheet. And on Wednesday, I have like my marketing up here. I'm going to promote reflective safety shirts. Uh, I'm going to put a offer for free mock-ups. I'm going to put a thumbnail to the blog post that, uh, that I did. And uh, I'm going to show off one of my celebrity customers. And, 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 well, dude, I swear, a lot of people, they have a super special customer that if other people knew about it, other people would say, oh, crap, if they're their customer, they must be good, right? Mm -hmm. And so I actually do it on purpose. I just shove that crap out. And I want everybody to know that, that, you know, that I do stuff for Tappany. I want everybody to know that I do stuff for uh, Advanced Electric. And, and so my marketing is very specific and on purpose. And so on Instagram, I will, whoever's a celebrity rock star out in Battleground, I will put it on Instagram and promote it toward that demographic in that region. Mm -hmm. And whoever is a, I've got a form where I go through and I like go through all of my customers that I, that I, that ordered last May and the May before where they're located. I rank them on a scale of one to five, how big they are on the celebrity scale. And that helps me focus on, how much I should be promoting the fact that I do work for them. And I've picked up, I've picked up jobs where they go, holy cow, you do stuff for Tappany? That's cool. We love those people. And, <laughs> and they're eager to work with me. Right. And, and so, yeah, I, I, all of this stuff's super on purpose. Excellent. Awesome. Go ahead, Meryl. Uh, oh, I was just going to follow up on that idea about the, the intention behind it and the, the method uh, something that really resonated with me when I went to your business was how you set up your studio for creating content. Uh, and I, the way you have that set up is so, so methodically brilliant. Uh, and I would love for you to kind of walk through how you set that up and what is behind that and talk about what that has done since you've adopted this, what it's done for your, for your business and just your overall followings response to what you put out. Sure. So with, um, you know, I had a couple of guys in my office yesterday, a couple of salespeople, and they came in to sell me um, on health insurance or something like that. But they left going, holy cow, we need shirts, right? And, mm -hmm. and the way that that worked was they came in and, I would, and, and we were talking about embroidery. And I said, dude, here's the thing. People judge you by your appearance, okay? People judge a book by its cover. Use that to your advantage. Dress up a little. Wear something embroidered. Show up looking super professional, and people will assume the best about you. If you've mm -hmm. got a nice piece of embroidered apparel on, they will assume that, 
and and if you're wearing something with a name brand on it, like a Nike or a uh, OGO or something of that nature, I think every salesman that's out talking to customers should have name brand embroidered apparel because it's not a huge expense, but it sends a message that we're put together. We don't, we don't, you know, we, there are no expenses that we won't do. Right. And, and we will spend that extra on ourselves, and we will spend that extra on you. Right. And, and so with my, with my studio, um, I decided that I was going to make it so that it looked more professional. I looked more put together because I want that trust. And I had shot a ton of video down in my showroom and the lights always changing because somebody's driving by and, and there's always like, there's just always some kind of distraction or disturbance. And so like upstairs, I bought, I bought, I don't know if I, if you felt the rubbery wall, like the mm, brick yeah. isn't brick, yeah. right? It's, it's a yeah. rubber faux thing that's like glued to a couple sheets of melamine and then I've got some light coming up from the bottom so that it's shadowed. And I've got um, uh, I've got a really nice like 36 inch soft box with um, a honeycomb in it so that the light gets on me, but it doesn't hit my background. Yeah. And my, my background is able to, um, like I went full on YouTuber today, but this isn't like my studio. My studio is actually upstairs and I've got like a little, um, uh, carousel that's that you hit the little button and, and it rotates around nice and smooth so I can I can put out videos and stuff where things just look a step up and and it looks nicer than than what you would expect like there's no confusion do I work out of my garage mm -hmm. I definitely don't and I definitely um, I put the investment into good audio um, I've got sound absorbing panels all over the place so that there's no echo. My audio sounds super tight. Um, and I spent a lot of time um, learning how to produce a video because like I told you yesterday, I actually run a marketing company that happens to sell screen printing. Absolutely right. Yes, that's, that's true. Awesome. Well, That's true. Cool, guys. Um, Want to kind of wrap up, Adam, and let everyone know where they can find you. I know you've got a couple websites um, where they can find Brainless um, and how people can follow you on Instagram and Facebook. So um, my the the shop's website is brainlesstees.com, and that's T-E-E-S. Uh, brainlessteas.com and my own website is adamfunderberg.com and that's where you can get the form and uh, you'll find videos there and and a handful of things where you know my like I said my goal is to I want to work 40 hours here at the shop and then I I will probably work 56 hours forever um, and I'm gonna I'll put in that last 16 hours working on helping other people avoid some of the pain that, that I went through and, and getting into a hole like what I got into and making it so that they can actually enjoy the benefits. You know, they can accelerate their learning five, six, eight years mm -hmm. in a short amount of time uh, versus doing it like me. Like I got bruises and calluses on my head <laughs> from from banging myself into things because I didn't know where I was going and I didn't know what, what I was doing. Um, awesome. Well, we'll definitely and, link that up in the description too, for anyone listening. Absolutely. Well, Adam, we appreciate having you uh, today. It was an awesome conversation. Um, a lot of good, good lessons that you've went through that definitely, I know I went through that mm. other people that are listening right now have went through, um, definitely reach out to Adam. If you're feeling any of that, that pain on his website, adamfunderberg.com. Um, feel free to call us if you ever need a shoulder to lean on to, um, and are, are going through this happy to share my stories as well and, and see what we can do to help you through. But, uh, great episode i uh, appreciate all of you out there listening and uh press onward and rock on rock on all right cool bye-bye
Huge thanks to Adam Funderburg for joining us today. As always, thank you for spending time with us this week. Tune in at your convenience wherever you listen to your podcast by searching Rock Shop Talk. Our next episode will discuss rebranding revolutions. If you'd like to request to be on the show, please visit rock.us slash rock shop talk. If you found today's episode helpful, please recommend it to a friend who you think may found it helpful as well. Please like, share, and subscribe on social media. Until next time, rockers, press onward. Onward.